like to welcome everybody today. My name is Larry Arthur. I am the president of the Indiana ACI. Um, today we're going to be talking with Sarah McGuire from Geotech on maturity monitoring in the current age. We also have with us the uh, one of the people on the uh, Merit Concrete Pumping Association board, Dan McCoy. He's actually helping sponsor these through that organization. Um, we're going to have people from all over the nation logging on today. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah McGuire so that she can take off. She's the presenter. Um, I ask that you hold your questions to the end, and if you can, mute your mics, and at the end, we'll uh, open it up for questions. So, Sarah, thank you for uh, doing this, hey. and uh, it's really a, a pleasure. Thanks, Larry. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, just a very quick introduction of myself and, and our company, Geotech. Um, we are based up in Ottawa, Canada. This is my first time doing one of these presentations to an ACI chapter online. So not really used to not having everybody in front of me to kind of get the head nods or the head shakes of, I know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. So hopefully um, the assumptions that I make along the way make a lot of sense. Um, Geotech, we are a company that's very specialized in, in concrete specifically and concrete testing. I myself, um, one of the senior directors there and have been with the company for roughly six years now. Um, and I came from not a concrete background. I came from the finance industry where it was very strict, regulated, very different. Uh, and after a few months of working in that industry, I thought I got to get the heck out of here because I'm, I think my soul will die here. Um, and that's kind of when I found concrete and this company specifically. Three weeks into working with them, uh, they took me to World of Concrete in, in Las Vegas, and I was an immediate convert. So um, that was about six years ago. And so today I'm going to be talking about um, the maturity method specifically, um, and then I'm going to have Dan McCoy kind of jump in. He's been doing some, some tests with some maturity sensors as well, and he'll be presenting a little bit about that. Um, just to go through a quick agenda, I'm not going to do the present presentation mode just because then I lose all of um, the other features here with GoToMeeting if I do that. Um, so hopefully this is good enough for everybody. Um, if Larry's okay with it, I'll uh, generate this into a PDF after, send it to him, and if anyone wants this for reference at a later date, no problem. Um, so as a general agenda, we're gonna go through, you know, the basic concrete strength cylinder test, kind of a recap of that and the other test methods. Then I am gonna dive into concrete maturity specifically, kind of walking through the standards how it works, how the calculation is done in a safe, in a trustworthy way, and how we implement it. We'll talk about a couple of examples, and uh, I'll bring up a couple of examples that are out of state, and then Dan will jump on to talk about one that's happening in state, and uh, we'll kind of wrap it up there with questions, and I'm sure Larry will kind of mediate the questions after, so um, normally I'd ask along the way, but I guess we'll just kind of have to hold those this time around. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to bring uh, up, something that I found really interesting when I got into this industry, is the technology adoption rate. Uh, if you are taking all the industry sectors that exist, there are about 24 industry sectors that everything can be grouped into, and construction is number 23 in, out of 24, just above agriculture uh, in terms of how advanced we are digitally. And there's a few, you know, reasons for this. Um, the main thing that I like kind of highlight with people is that bringing technology into the sector, we need to be very cautious and careful because, you know, unlike media, uh, they don't necessarily have lives at stake when something goes wrong, and we do. So there's a good reason for this. Um, but also it means that there's a lot of room for evolution and improvement, which is really exciting and something that was really interesting to me when getting familiar with the industry. Um, and so one example that I wanted to bring up and kind of why we're here, this is an example of the Skyline Towers in Fairfax, something that happened you know, nearly 50 years ago. Uh, and typically the type of example that we would talk about when we're referring to not capturing field strengths uh, accurately and acting prematurely. And this was a situation where formwork was stripped too early uh, and it did cause a collapse that killed 14 people. Now, up until recently, when we would talk about kind of the, the issues of, of not getting strength on time or you know a bad break coming back, whatever that means to you, we would do, typically be talking about the time wasted, the money saved, the cost of kind of going through all the motions of that. Um, because a lot of the time, these types of incidents wouldn't really happen. People don't necessarily act prematurely. Instead, they wait 
until they can truly validate the results, which costs us a lot of money in our pocket. Um, but that kind of changed around this time last year. It was mid-October of, of last year uh, when the New Orleans, the Hard Rock Cafe that was being built collapsed. And I remember this very perfectly because this actually crossed over our Canadian Thanksgiving. We have Thanksgiving a month earlier than, than you guys do, um, mostly because of the harvest season, but I'm not going to get into that now. And I immediately saw this and had to check immediately to see if our sensors were, were being used in this project. Um, and of course they, they weren't, but that's always something that you think about when you see a class like that, you know, everyone who's on the project, whether they're involved in it or not, um, wants to know what's going on. And over the course of the next month, um, our company started to get a lot of calls from Louisiana and some of the bordering states, mostly in New Orleans, but a little bit outside. And it was because this was starting to come to light that the reason that this happened or the preliminary investigation that's been conducted is that the samples that were broken in one lab uh, in the laboratory, the samples that were broken were attributed to this project, but were actually from a different project. And that's actually what they believe caused the collapse. Now, we all know that in our industry, it'll take years before that's actually verified and validated, but that's been the initial kind of reporting. And in a climate like New Orleans, we don't really expect these things to happen. We're very conscious of this in you know, the Northern states and well, up in Canada, of course, we're very conscious of this when it comes to cold weather curing of concrete, that there's some serious you know, ramifications and we, we're very careful with that and it's definitely in the forefront of our mind. Um, but things like this don't necessarily need to happen. And uh, so that's kind of part of what, uh, it's unfortunate to have an example of that now, um, but it is something that we really wanna see that we can do away with this. So we're gonna be talking about in place strength of concrete and as essentially any time that you're pulling cylinders in order to be able to accelerate through your project, um, when you're not just waiting for the seven and 14 day breaks, if it's because you wanna pull the cables, saw cutting, opening traffic up early so that people can get on the road, all of those applications, anytime mm -hmm. we're projects, um, where time is of the essence, this is where we want to be using um, this method and what I'm gonna be focusing on today. So the early age stage concrete construction, we know this process very well. Um, we're batching the concrete, pouring, taking out the cylinders and breaking them at certain intervals so that we can make the decisions we need to on site. But there are limitations to this method. Um, just like any method, there are limitations. The first one, the big major one is the curing temperature. And uh, the temperature of these cylinders, it's just, you know, we're getting close to Thanksgiving now and we cook our turkeys, our, our 20 pound turkeys and our 40 pound turkeys like at different, at, at different uh, temperatures for a reason. Because when you're taking a small, you know, sample of four by eight, it's very hard to replicate that four by eight cylinder to actually be representative of what's happening within the slab. Um, and if we are able to do that, it's probably a very tedious process, something that we've all been become accustomed to, but it's simply just not as representative as it could be. There's also a, definitely a delay in the results that are coming in. Um, there's also limited information. If we are taking a break at day one and things are looking good, and day three, something's gone wrong, we don't really have a lot of visibility into what happened between day one and day three. There's also local strength variations that are not very easy to capture in these um, in these cylinders. It's very specific to mass concrete, but really even when we're talking about pulling cables, what's happening within the core of the core is not necessarily the same thing as what's happening around the perimeter. Uh, and as a whole, this is just a, a lower visibility method, something again, we've all come accustomed to, but we can definitely make improvements to this. And so, uh, the in-place strength of concrete, there are other non-destructive methods to measure uh, in-place strength. And, you know, we could go through a, a lot of these, but today we're really just going to focus on concrete maturity specifically. Um, and just for reference, you know, as this is the, the ACI chapter, the maturity method is referenced in code 318 around, um, around uh, maturity, saying that it is an acceptable method to use. Um, so it has been in the ACI codes for some time, and Larry and I were speaking about this a couple of days ago. The ACI 306R guideline actually does was revised by ACI back in 2017 to actually state that the um, using cylinders for cold weather concrete um, for getting that representation is not really accurate enough anymore on its own. And of course, 
the main reason that this needs to be paid attention to is because in the winter time, you're more likely to have higher break results in the cylinders and lower results in your slab. Whereas in the summertime, we're looking at lower results in the brakes and higher in, in the actual slab. So in the winter, it's a very big liability issue. Whereas in the summer, we actually have a lot of time that we could benefit, which could be money in all of our pockets. Um, but the field cleared cylinders, just the use of the cylinders is inappropriate and should not be allowed in cold weather concreting. This is mainly related to the difficulty in maintaining the cylinder in any approximation of the condition of the structure. So it really, they really did kind of drill into this a few years ago. Um, now people are still definitely using field cylinders, but most of the time they're at least validating those results um, to make sure that, that they're following the best practices. And in terms of the Indiana DOT at this time, there's no exact mention of maturity in the code. Um, these are the list of states, I believe there's 28 on this list. These are a list of states that have it written in the codes of how they want it to be used if you're using it, what the right practice is to do it. Uh, that being said, there's a lot of, of DOTs that are not listed on this that we are doing projects on right now, including, <coughs> excuse me, including right here in Indiana right here in Indiana, so to speak. Um, there are a few uh, projects happening right now and um, Dan is gonna be speaking to those uh, today. So the maturity method, uh, just to get into the technical aspects of it, I won't go too in, deep, uh, too in depth on this because some people, again, this is where I would look in the room and I would say, who's brand new to this? Who's used this before? Um, I'm just going off of the basis that this is brand new to everyone and we'll stick with that and I can definitely answer some further questions after. Um, maturity is essentially is taking the relationship between the time and temperature of your concrete. And what it's saying is that if you have the same concrete mix in two different temperatures, one maybe in a high temperature, one in a low temperature, over time that concrete mix is going to cure at a higher rate in the higher temperature and a lower rate in the lower temperature. So you're looking for that time temperature factor, which we call maturity, that will essentially develop the same, we're actually calculating for the area under the temperature curve. And so that area of the temperature curve, if you're uh, able to see on my screen, that area under the curve will generate faster if we're dealing in higher heat and generate slower if we're, if we're working in lower heat. Um, and that is essentially how the rule works. What is done that there are three different ways of calculating it, but the most simple and the one that we use most commonly here in America is the nurse stall uh, method. And that is essentially what you are doing is you are breaking five different cylinders. You can do more, but you should not do less. You are breaking cylinders at five different intervals and plotting them on the curve um, with their time temperature factors at each point. And what it will do is generate a curve for you that once you place the sensors into the concrete and taking this curve here, it will essentially say if you're dealing in higher heat, that curve is going to adjust up. And if you're dealing in lower heat, that curve is going to go down. It's very, it really is very simple, um, but it can be not necessarily time consuming, but something that you need to think out of how you're going to do it. So the basic way is taking five sets of three cylinders, you break two at a time, um, if for whatever reason, uh, the results between the two are not within a 10% variance, which if you're curing them in a lab environment, rarely going to be the case, that would be the time that you would break the third cylinder. While at the same time, you are monitoring the temperature and time factor in two equal size cylinders, which is very important. This can be done in four by eight, this can be done in six by 12, this can be done in beams, this could be done in big cubes, as long as it's all the same so that you are getting the same temperature time factor here that you would have in these cylinders as well. And what you're doing is you're mapping a relationship together that as long as you keep consistent with that mix and it stays with the same profile, you should continue to get the same results. I will go into the limitations of this method after because I'm sure there are questions around that, um, but I'll leave it there for now. Um, and this is an example of just the consistency of those cylinders that's really important to maintain because we want to get an accurate representation of how that concrete is curing over time in that same environment. So that way we establish a really good baseline for when we change temperatures and we change environments so that it will react appropriately. That's a brief overview of maturity. Again, I'll have to take questions after because Larry's gonna have to moderate that. I'm not quite familiar with the system and how to work that. 
Uh, now, the way that maturity had been done before, I think, you know, we've done quite a lot of work um, with a few contractors in Indiana already, and they all seem to be very familiar with the wired systems. Um, before Geotech came to the market, it was approximately five years ago from right around this time. Uh, with our maturity sensors, this was really the only type of system that we saw in, in the market. Still very useful, um, but very cumbersome and really had to be on big projects with very few mixes in order to justify the legwork that would go into it. This was definitely used as a time-saving benefit, maybe less from a liability, but more time savings on those really big projects. And essentially people would walk around with units that kind of look like those Texas instrument calculators that when I said that to my 14 year old niece, she had no idea what I was talking about, but we're all familiar with them. And they would walk around and manually plug this into every individual sensor. But again, doing this was still a lot faster than waiting for the cylinders to come back because they were able to get real time results and have a little bit more predictability around it. Um, but this was really kind of the main types of systems that we would have seen up until about five years ago. And um, projects like really large projects like this, this is the CN Tower, um, is actually it's kind of a fun fact that I like to share is this was the first big structure that was built using maturity to actually rely on the results. Um, and so that's in not our nation's capital. People assume that a lot. Ottawa is the capital, but Toronto is really the city people care about. Um, and so that was really the first project that was, that was used and they saved so much time. Um, they saved a lot of money on their work with the amount of work that had to go around it. Um, and the results were achieved within the first three days, which in 1973, that's a very big accomplishment. Uh, but on a project like this, it was super easily justified. What a massive project. The time savings in a project like this would amount to so much money that of course it made sense to have just a dedicated person or two walking around, plugging the sensors in and, and doing that work. But now we're seeing a really big shift um, in the use of these, uh, this technology, not just because of our company, because of others, and this is kind of a question that we get a lot is, you know, why now? Why, why is this suddenly coming up when this has been an ASTM standard since 1967? Why are we talking about this so much now? Uh, and, you know, one of, the, one of the big reasons is because the technology has really evolved. Um, I can't speak that much to other technology out there, but when we brought our, you know, wireless sensor to the market back five years ago, it would took a long time to convince people that if you put a sensor into the concrete and it was completely submerged for them to be able to trust results like that, it was a real had to see it to believe it at the time. Um, but it did make it so simple because what we did with the sensor was, as you can see, it's tied around the rebar. It's, um, it's embedded. Um, the way that it works is it's embedded into the rebar and then we take that temperature cable and extend it down. This is fully Bluetooth. So once it's submerged in the concrete, you're able to just connect with it to your phone. And so we've taken a very cumbersome process and we've said, here's your phone, here's the sensor, tag it in, connect and see the results. Now it can be very simple this way, or we now have more power around this. We are able to get these analytics right on our dashboards, right on our phones. We're able to set thresholds within the system and say, even just for temperature, if I go above or below a certain temperature, um, then I wanna be notified instantly. And that's something that we can do now generating reports super easily, being able to have everything operate on site from, from your phone. I mean, if, if I can shop for my groceries online, I'd like to be able to check my concrete as well. So this is all very possible now, um, when it just really, the technology wasn't there before for us to really be able to use this in a lot of projects. Uh, another thing that um, our company specifically is doing is we've added um, an extra layer of validation into the system um, her name is Roxy, just like you have Alexa in your home and Siri on your phone. Uh, Roxy is now built into our software. Um, she's our artificial intelligence and she actually is able to pick up um, outliers in the system and tell you something looks wrong here, um, make a change. So the first thing that Roxy was able to do was uh, she's able to identify the pouring time. Pouring time is super critical when dealing with maturity because when you're taking that baseline of temperature and you're matching it against the algorithm if you get that pouring time incorrect and you place it incorrectly it's going to start calculating strength from the wrong time so imagine we say that the pouring time happened a few hours earlier than it did and we're dealing with high early concrete that we need the results within 24 hours that can be a critical issue 
So now if that happens, Roxy is actually able to identify your pouring time for you um, and make those suggestions for you. So it's just an extra layer of validation in there. We also have in the system maturity calibration um, checks. This is something that's been a huge issue in the past with people trusting the data, saying that if my mix changes, if the proportions change, you know, what happens? And our system can tell you. We have it built in now where we say if you have a certain percentage of, of cement and fly ash and slag and water and whatever that is, based on the curve that's generated, she'll say, yep, this looks right. No, this looks wrong. Um, and she'll actually be able to pick those things up for you so that we can stop those any mistakes like that from happening. Um, Roxy has also been able to add features in there like cement reduction and understanding if you can become leaner in your mixes, but that's a little bit less about verifying maturity and a little bit more about what Geotech is doing right now. And, you know, with, within only five years of really working with this technology, the main area, of course, is always going to be North America. Myself, for the company I work within the Americas is kind of my um, region of focus in Australia, New Zealand as well. Um, but this is where our real focus is in North America. We have, you know, projects happening in every state at this point. Um, we do have them happening internationally, not as widespread because that's not really our focus, but it's because of how simple the technology is now. We are able to service, you know, clients that don't even speak the same language as us because we have been able to make it simple for them to, to do. Um, and that's been a really, really neat thing to see in the industry. Just kind of as a whole, the benefit of maturity that we see is you're getting continuous real-time results. I'm able to see on my phone over 24 hours, every 15 minutes within those 24 hours, how those curves have developed, what's happened. If any um, outliers are happening during that time, I can pick them up. You're also capturing the exact curing conditions of the concrete, which, you know, on one hand, you have the field cured cylinders that crush the um, cylinders and give you the real strength of, of the cylinders, but that's not necessarily the real strength of the slab. When we're crushing, when we're getting the temperature of the slab, we might not be getting the real, real strength, but what we are getting is the real temperature, which oftentimes leads to more accurate results. Uh, the sensors can also be embedded fully at this point, which means that there's no risk of tampering with data. Once it's in there, it's in there, it's solid. You're not gonna have anyone tamper with it. The cold hard data will always be in there to grab at any time. Uh, this will capture variations across the structure. I think that's probably one of the biggest benefits is being able to place the sensors in different areas and see um, the, the gaps and how your concrete's curing. As a whole, you can also be using these just for thermal control plans. Um, this is improving safety, lowering risk, and the biggest one for sure is delivering projects faster. Um, that's a benefit to most people that are within the project. If you can deliver it faster and increase your timelines, that just saves everybody. Uh, you know, I, I, I like to, I kind of, one of the big things that I noticed as we were getting more hands-on with our customers is that concrete really is one, one of the first, if not kind of considered the first thing that's done in every project. And if we fall behind in that aspect, it just has a domino ripple effect throughout the rest of the project. So being, you know, being able to really contribute to that part is very important. And, you know, a common question always is, okay, well, what's the cost? Tell, tell me what that is. And these are actually, these are numbers that I've taken from uh, one of our customers who, they did some really in-depth tests out on the West, um, out in Arizona. They did some really intense tests of how this broke down for them. And uh, we estimated that, let's say you were doing a high rise, those are always the easiest ones to just kind of see the benefit right away. If you're doing a high rise structure and you're pouring 300 cubic yards of concrete, you're gonna need about three sensors per. We have averaged out the cost of any system out there. The highest cost that you're ever going to see is $250 sensor. Once you've included the labor, calibrating the mix, anything that kind of goes into that, I'm saying 250, you should never be paying more than that. So even if we're going for the highest cost possible, um, the entire project at that point would cost $15,000. And most people throughout North America at this point have said anywhere from 12,000 to 20,000 after labor and operation costs is how much they're spending in a day. So the ability to save a day, if you are able to tweak your timeline in that way, um, there's some huge benefits here. And uh, that's, that's something that a lot of our customers are seeing more so in the summertime when their cylinders are just never going to get the heat that their slab is. This is a really big benefit to them to be able to speed things up. Um, so one of the examples that we, uh, we've recently come across was this is a, a company that we work with out in Kansas City. 
Um, they were doing this multifamily complex and essentially what happened um, was that they were dealing with temperatures as low as 20 Fahrenheit. They weren't really expecting that at the time. The agency that they were working with cast the cylinders, kept them next to the formwork. They tried to wrap them, but they just couldn't really um, get them to be wrapped the way that the, um, that the concrete itself was wrapped. They ended up not getting the right results back. Um, they had to go around and walk around with a rebound hammer and test before, obviously caused a couple of days and delays. After that, they were able to use the sensors and they were able to validate that the brakes were, were not accurate. And this even, they claim that this has even prevented them from having to rip out the columns altogether because of like some pretty intense issues that were happening at the time. Once they were able to just put the sensors in there, share it with the testing agency, the owner, the GC, the sub, everyone was kind of on the same page. It was very easy going from there. Those two days of delays that they had cost twice as much as the sensors they would have had to use. So it was a big win for them. Um, and this is another example that's really relevant to kind of what we're looking, what we're seeing happen in Indiana right now. Um, this happened about just over a year ago. The Louisiana DOT, um, we work with a ready mix company down there and they were really trying to get this approved within uh, the standards and the codes. And so what they did was they conducted the test. Um, they placed sensors into the concrete. They did, you know, the calibrations that they needed to do. And they just needed to reach 3000 PSI to open the road. When they were using the maturity sensors, the results were already showing 4,500 PSI, whereas the cylinders were barely breaking at 3,000. And you know, the first reaction was, okay, this doesn't make sense. This is witchcraft. These sensors, you know, to throw them away, this is wrong. And we just said, okay, well, I'll slow down, slow down. Put one sensor in the cylinder. Put one sensor in the slab, and just do a floor. Don't even monitor, you know, the the, the strength. Just monitor the temperature. And what they saw immediately the next day was that in the first 24 hours, which is the most critical time for your curing of concrete, the cylinders never even broke 100 Fahrenheit, whereas the, the concrete almost got to 135 every time. And of course, when we're having those types of high heat in those critical hours of curing your concrete, that is going to have a huge, huge change in, in how your concrete's going to cure. So they ended up writing the specification. They, they still you know, obviously wanted a buffer, which is completely understandable. Um, but they rewrote their specification to say, if you use maturity sensors and you wait for 34 P 30, 3,400 PSI just to add a buffer, and now they do feel confident to rely on those. Uh, it took a few years for us to get them to agree to do a study like that and, and actually pave the way for that. Uh, but once we got that done, now it's just been very, very simple for them moving forward. Uh, I will turn it over to Dan now. If Dan wants to jump on and speak, I think we have to unmute him. Um, I'm unmuted. I don't know how I to do I'm this. Okay. Hold on. Oh, there you go. All right. Thank uh, you. Oh, th thank you, Sarah. Uh, so I entered this um, on my own accord, and I because I brought up questions to myself as an engineer and um, a lot of inconsistencies in the DOT world as, you know, we would have conversations between each other, both my, um, uh, my work associates and um, in-dot engineers, and we would say, well, how well does this test specimen represent what's there? What do we know about what's there? And, you know, I just did some looking um, online, talked with Larry a little bit, found out about Geotech, and I said, well, let's try this. Um, all on my own accord. And um, this specific project here is NDOT Bridge B4180 uh, um, and is on um, I-69 north of uh, US-6 in Waterloo. And there are several main reasons that we wanted to know this. Um, so I wanted specifically to know this and I thought everybody else would kind of take it interesting. There are some new things going on in Indiana that relate to internal cure. Uh, so different internal cure methods within the concrete. So we, this was one of the test pours we decided to do um, where we did, um, we used an admixture um, called E5 to cure the concrete um, internally rather than using a wet cure scenario. So we had a lot of questions about um, you know, what are the strengths and what are we getting out of this uh, wet cure? It's kind of be interesting to see what's going on inside the concrete, in the slab itself, versus what's going on with the test specimens. 
so that was number one. Number two was this project um, was uh, kind of a front runner. We volunteered to do it for um, a monolithic placement between the reinforced concrete bridge approach and the three span slab structure. Um, normally in the past, they, they had had some bad luck with 1A joints, which is that meeting between the reinforced concrete bridge approach and the bridge structure at the end bend itself. So we said, you know, we can, we can do this. We've done it before. We think we can do it. We want to be an example of how to do it. Um, so we took that initiative and there were some questions and we did deck four sequences to figure out, you know, and it goes into placement rate for these bridges. So you, you want to be able to place that concrete and continue across it uh, without significant deflection in your false work or some of the structural members um, so that you don't get an initial set um, that's out of time for that deflection to take place or you can end up with some transverse cracking. Um, so it was interesting. We figured on this job it was a safe trial because it's my false work that's a slab bridge. Um, so it's not going anywhere unless my false work fails. Um, so we knew that my deflections were very limited. So we placed uh, the, I placed the sensors in engineer areas. Uh, instead of just wanting to know what the overall concrete did, I wanted to know where, where I knew the concrete was going to see the most stress. So I, for reference, uh, we had our, we set up our cylinders, we did all of our um, controlled testing on the same day as the pour. I knew everything was going to go okay, but this would be great to set up for future use. And um, I placed the sensors um, in one approach lab, and then in the next span uh, at the center span, which is where I should get my uh, greatest uh, positive moment. So as I'm looking, you know, at uh, at a shear moment diagram, if I get my greatest positive moment there, I've obviously got the most um, extreme fiber bending stress there as well too. So if I wanted to know where good concrete was and what it was, I would want to put it in inherently in the design where I knew there would be the most stress. So I so those two sensors on either side were um, dual purpose. One to tell me, okay, here's the difference uh, in distance and then temperature for initial set for that one A joint. And then number two, it would tell me um, the differences in the approach concrete, which was the same mix, and then the slab concrete, uh, which should give me, I, I use the, what was nice about the sensors, they come with a three foot cable or a 10 foot cable at the time, and I used a three foot cable, I can put that sensor, if I put, the I guess the the receiver or or the actual puck I'll call it near the surface so it can grab a Bluetooth signal. I can then take the tail of that or the the temperature monitoring sensor and I can place it right where I want to know what's going on. So in the in the slab I place it in the lower portion of the of the of the center of the slab to attain. I that's where my uh, my positive moment is going to be. So I want to know what temperature and what care I'm getting there. Likewise, over the piers, uh, you have a negative moment development. Uh, so you're you're going to have this you're going to have a negative moment that's uh, maximized depending on the geometry of the structure. But it's it's generally maximized there. So that's what I did with those sensors is I placed those near the top of the slab um, to see what kind of strength we were getting right there. So I placed those throughout. I believe the approach slabs I placed directly in the middle. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I, I placed those directly in the middle, but it's it's very interesting to tell, you know, when you're looking at a single sample and you say, um, you know, for a test beam or whatever, and we say, well, that represents the concrete, when all of us as engineers know that that doesn't exactly, you know, there's always questions in our mind, but this is a really good way to verify that, and that's what I was really surprised to find out, um, was not only that, but how, how great the um, result was, you know, we weren't breaking... Um, we weren't breaking beams prior to this with DOTs in under three days. Um, so naturally in three to five days, most of these beams were going. We look at, at uh, once we were done with our maturity um, and we looked at, and the results show that we had sufficient strength in, in 20 hours. Now there's probably some DOT guys on here that are gonna go, wait a minute, too soon. 
and I, 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 I would agree for some structures uh, like this under controlled scenarios, yes. Um, uh, but because of the internal curing and because of the 1A joint, we wanted to know because we knew that the questions were going to come from contractors with using internal curing, that if we take away a seven day wet cure period, which pretty much limits the contractor to what they can do during that seven days as far as load application goes, regardless of beam break, now they were going to be asking, well, we have uh, we have a beam break, but it's prior to seven days. What are we going to do? And I think DOT is trying to um, get that under control right now. Um, they may be well on their way to saying, okay, at, at a certain at a certain point, this is our minimum time to let this structure set, and here's our minimum strength. But what this shows uh, is a lot of, of information for this specific project, and I think this this pro this as INDOT in total, as we've gone to what's really nice about DOTs is it spells out for us. Uh, we're not like commercial construction where you have uh, several engineers working on different projects and they may spec different concretes for different purposes. In DOT world, we're dealing with pretty much the same mix all the way around. Um, and I got to give it to Mike Nelson and, uh, with INDOT making you know, our aggregate uh, more sustainable and, and a better fit for tarantula curve, things like that. But we're dealing with a mix that's pretty much the same um, water cement ratio. Uh, the same cement content. We've we've got everything balanced pretty well. If a class a class C concrete is usually a class C concrete, and class A concrete is usually a class A concrete, and it's close, and that really does wonders for maturity testing because you're not changing the mix inherently that much. So it can tell you a lot over a wide variety of contracts with the same mix, and I think that's what's helpful. So um, overall experience with Geotech, I. I thought it was great and it did what I wanted to in the fact that it gave me a safety factor after I looked at everything and said, wow, you know, not only were the compressive cylinders for the test working out, but when I converted that um, using any different method you want, it really compared nicely with the beam brakes. So it, it really was a good verification of what was happening. Um, and I, I think it ought to be something I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I say push, but I, it's more of like encourage. I, I would encourage this to be used or allowed to be used um, in the future for for determining things uh, like false work, um, release, or traffic application uh, in in terms of time and strength, and to verify in conjunction with whatever tests were taken. Um, and I, I like the fact that it's just another it's it's another tool in the toolbox to be able to tell us that um, either something is working or something isn't. Um, obviously, Sarah brought up uh, New Orleans, and if you see a sensor telling you one thing and a test or a break telling you something else, and there's a significant difference between those two, that at least in my mind as an engineer tells me I need to stop and I need to reanalyze what's going on here, rather than either blindly going off of a test or several tests um, or even the maturity meter uh, itself. But a good double verification was really nice um, in that case, and um, in, in especially in, in INDOT's case, um, uh, we found some, some very good results that would lead me to believe that when I'm taking my false work out under um, of just about a million and a half pounds of concrete, I want to know that it's going to stay there. So uh, it, it meant a lot to me. And um, what the other thing that I did like specifically about the Geotech program was on how online what I could do. Um, now you can generate reports, and I think, uh, yeah, Sarah's got a portion of the report up there that, that's an overall, but I think there's it's got a report for each cylinder. Uh, or each sensor that we did. So you had the, yeah. the sensors in the bridge deck, and then you had uh, two additional sensors that were in the uh, cured uh, test samples. And that's how it creates that maturity curve based on the breaks from the samples to the temperature. And what I thought, I guess, what I thought was really great is the report's great, but then you can really go into um, 
they have like a cloud-based server you go into and then you can really play around with things and you can look at temperature data export it to uh, to um, an excel file to where you can see and roxy helps with that um, as a matter of fact i remember when we were pouring that day um, uh, you know roxy came on and asked it's almost as soon as that concrete was over the sensor uh, roxy came on and said hey we've noticed um this looks like there's a significant change in temperature would you like to call this the pour time yeah, absolutely it was perfect every sensor hit right on the money so um it was really neat so then each sensor not only just the pour we don't just say that we we poured this bridge at starting at 5 30 um on such and such a date now we can tell that the concrete reached what sensor at what time so now we've got a really good history of what's going on here and um then when you look at that in 15 minute intervals which is i believe what it, what it uh, records at and then you collect that data you can see then you know time to initial set time it's gaining strength the temperature there um, and I think uh, Sarah might have touched on it, maybe she didn't, but you can set different thresholds in there as far as what you consider to be curing. Um, and Larry, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think ACI says per ASTM for maturity testing that that threshold for temperature in, um, for, in a, for a concrete to still be gaining strength, um, 32 degrees is your limit. That's what your threshold is. So it calculates all that area above the curve from the 32 degrees to whatever you've got as your cure um but what I, I like is if you want to be a little the nice thing about the sensor something? yeah the nice thing about the sensor is that you can actually set it to what you want your datum to be and the datum is where you stop measuring so if you look at a lot of the projects we do wastewater and they say we can't go below 50 degrees and that can't be included in your curing time we can actually create that to where if the concrete starts to drop below that one, you're gonna get an alarm that's gonna be sent to you that you're starting to drop. Um, and then the other thing too that we can get is we stop recording there. So you're only recording what you are over good temperature that's set in the specifications. So that's all either lined out with either freezing, which is zero, or we can actually um, set it to any, any temperature we want. And I, I think that's very beneficial because I was talking to more so, you know, when when you look in the in-dot specification, it plainly says that, you know, if the temperature drops below 40 degrees, 50 degrees, and it, it depends on what you're doing, but you can set that threshold and it says, well, this won't count for curing. And it's really amazing because that's what um, the maturity index really does for you on its own. Once you set that threshold, it gives you the true um, what you set that threshold to to come out to that's what I really I really like about it is the user manipulation or the ability to for a DOT to say and set yeah you can use this but let's set a threshold of this so we make sure that our curing is is so and so and just like Sarah mentioned you know if, if you want to add that buffer in there um, that's fine but what I found with this bridge was um, that the strengths um, consistently exceeded um or matched perfectly what that what our test results were from the actual from the actual break data when converted from flexural into compressive so i a lot of positives a lot of positives about it i will say they say that their limitation is about one or two inches below the concrete surface for a bluetooth signal one sensor in the approach lab i i knew was a little low um, because when they went across it, I saw that it got some, it got additional coverage, um, and maybe it moved the actual puck, and I was worried that maybe I wouldn't get it, and I think it actually ended up going through, I was able to get that signal off of, with, with even four inches of concrete coverage. I'm sure they won't advertise that or say that wow. it'll do it, but I was impressed that, um, you could still maintain that two inch, at least clearance in the deck. Um, and get a signal. And then even in some places you could go a little deeper and I just set my phone down a little closer and it picked up the data right away. So um, with that, I don't know, um, I'll give it back to Sarah and Larry, uh, but if anybody's got any questions from the DOT in that specific job, I would be more than, more than happy to answer. Um, can I add something real quick to this? Um, using this in a DOT setting with what we're trying to do, You'd have to create a maturity curve, like with our class C, you'd have to create 
several several curves one with flash one with slag one with micro silica and then and the micro silica would be at three percent and seven percent based on the state specs and that would you'd have to have a curve for each region regions that use lehigh lafarge boozy uh, fairchild you'd have to have a curve all four of those would have to be run in each mix and then you could use them across the board but knowing which cement you're using and having the curve that works with it and then periodically you're going to need to run a validation where you're going to have to make a set of cylinders just to verify that you're getting the same thing drop a cylinder in them compare them to brakes they need to be within 10 percent per the ASTM that's going to give you a good guideline and be right where you need to be and you can always do that and verify them but each year you'd have to run one on each type of cement and on each type of class C that you've got. Sarah, it's all yours. No, that's a, that's a really good point. Yeah, actually, Dan, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions um, just to kind of drill into some of the things. The first thing I do wanna mention is that yes, we don't advertise that you can install the sensors deeper. However, we can guarantee that at two inches, it doesn't matter what's in your concrete, you'll get that signal. So obviously the range is gonna change based on, you know, um, there's thousands of different types of concrete out there. The other thing that kind of, you know, strikes to people is that if you embed the sensors at the very beginning, it's actually the two things that most affect Bluetooth signal is water and steel. So at your wettest concrete, that's going to be your weakest signal. So it'll only get stronger and stronger as you go. And within a few hours, that kind of, it actually kind of picks it up. Um, I did want to ask, because you mentioned that this was such a good point of verification that, wow, this really helps you realize or affirm, yes, I'm good or no, I'm not. And I'm wondering, especially as we're going into the colder weather, your experience is last year during the cold weather. How many times, if, if you can count, maybe it's, you know, you can count on one hand, maybe you can't count on two. How many times did you wish you had that verification? Oh, wow. Actually, uh, quite a lot. Um, because you you end up getting into concretes where you consider cold weather concretes and i would i definitely uh would think that and i guess larry could probably go into this because it's it's probably pretty finicky with aci but there's different testing methods um and what is allowed and what is not allowed per aci and mm -hmm. astm for taking some of these samples and curing some of these samples for testing versus the benefits for maturity testing. So maturity testing, you can, mm -hmm. you can still place and you can still use your maturity index uh, for, for the mix that you have, as Larry, as, as Larry stated. Um, but it's, and I, I think he could talk more to that, but yes, I, I would say for cold weather concrete, I, I would have a lot more confidence with it than I would um, relying on uh, sample uh, breakage it just just because of the exposure uh, of a bridge deck or you even have a heated deck and you you have this mass concrete pour that's that's curing you've got hydration going on and then off to the side you've got this little six by six by 18 inch beam that's supposed to be curing with it and and mm -hmm. it's just thermodynamics on its on its own just says that that sample is going to be cooler and it's not going to get the same amount of hydration as as what your mass pour is. And I, I think that's one other, I, I forgot to mention too, but even if you didn't want to know strength, one of the other applications for this that I could see as an engineer is in true mass pours where you want to monitor or even control overheating due to hydration. Mm -hmm. You could look in real mm -hmm. time and know what the temperature of that was, even if you had cooling devices in in a mass pour to control the hydration of that concrete we don't get in it we don't get in it so much with bridges but um some of those mass yeah. foundations the strength isn't so much important but knowing that temperature um i mean the strength is important but not knowing the strength at that moment is but knowing that what the temperature of the concrete is at so many different places can tell somebody a lot about what's going on with curing and hydration yeah i think you've you've touched on a really interesting thing there because that is one of the big applications for us as well, wind farms, is something that just completely took off because of those foundations and how quickly they want to try any rest. But being able to know the differentials there is so, so crucial. So yeah, that's a very, that's a very good um, point. And I'm glad to hear that Roxy helped you out because when, you know, when we first brought her on, I wasn't sure, you know, how many times she would actually be able to be useful. But as we hear more people say, Roxy, help me do this and Roxy, help me do that, it's kind of neat to hear. So, um, you know, we sell, Smart Rock, 
So well, Rock C. for somebody that somebody that really likes doing things right, um, I don't like guessing um, at what time pours were. Um, so yeah. you know, rather than input 5:30 for sensor one or 5:46 for sensor two, which is something that I'd have to keep track of and record and do, mm -hmm. I just verified as it went along, and she just updated me and said, "It looks like there's a temperature change here. Do you want to do you want to set a um, start time for your pour?" And it did it for each sensor. It was uh, it was pretty surprising. I really liked how you could break it out per sensor in hours mm -hmm. rather than us as what engineers are used to is in days of how old is that for right. us well, two days old. or it's you know now right. now right. we're talking exactly. hours. well th this approach this approach is actually seven hours older than this approach by the time you're done so um it was yeah. it was kind of neat to look at um larry did i did i misspeak anything with aci about cold weather concrete and how we're supposed to treat samples no um the the big one uh with with samples is you know being able to control it but really what a good contractor will do is once he learns the software one of the things that i've done in the past is you use it to control what you're doing how long do i apply heat how long do i have to keep the heat going am i heating the structure evenly you know if i've got my, all my heaters setting on one side of the building and i'm pumping air in one side might only be at 35 degrees at the deck and the other side might be at 70 just because of the air movement so being able to use the sensor in the same way to maintain what your concrete's doing and understand that it'll help you create a better slab. And it's critical when you start to think about it is a lot of people want 70% on cylinders and we're going out and we're breaking cylinders that have been kept at 70 degrees. My slab's only pumping along at 50 degrees. And, mm -hmm. you know, we just had a situation today that they poured a slab and it already cracked where they drove a truck on it. And they're like, well, we got cylinders at 70 degrees. Yes. I mean, in the lab, but they're kept at 70 and the slab outside was an average of 45. This was in northern Ohio. And they went ahead and put opened it to heavy traffic. Well, if they were only getting 3,000 in a lab at seven days, they're probably only at 18 to 2,000 in the actual slab. So no, having to have some, having something in there that you can actually tell real time will limit your liabilities and reduce your costs long term. But in your bridge world, if we can get on it faster, the, the savings and getting a project done faster and the money that you make, that could be the difference in being profitable for a season and not being profitable. Well, as an engineer, I, um, certainly, like to, I, I certainly like to know what strength I'm dealing with rather than saying I've got 400 yards here and I've only got so many tests to go on. It's really nice to just, uh, I'd rather overdo it on the sensors and and each each sensor just confirmed what the last one did. So there was a consensus of the data, which is what I like to see as an engineer. Good. Um, just for the sake of time, because we now only have six minutes, I'm sure some people have, actually it's 4 p.m. Hopefully you guys are all going home, but um, we'll just kind of skip along here to the next couple. You know, at the end of the day, of course, we're an advocate for maturity, but I always want to talk to people about the limitations. Um, the first one being mixed change, which is something that we did talk about and Larry pointed out that, you know, you do have to establish those baselines for every mix and from every supplier. The big thing is, especially if you're changing cement suppliers, you definitely have to redo um, your mix calibration. Uh, the one, the major thing here that, you know, we've done from that perspective is we've made it a lot easier to be able to implement that. You know, Dan was talking about how um, you use the system to make that happen. And we've spoken to users of this system before where they said it could sometimes take them over an hour just to calibrate one mix and get that going. Now I would say in our system, it could take two minutes. So when you need to do three or four in a day, that could save you, you know, that's the difference between half your day gone and being able to get it done within a coffee break, which is nice. Um, the datum temperature is also something that Larry touched on is the datum temperature is set at which at the time that we say that strength is no longer um, or your concrete is no longer gaining strength. Typically, we just put freezing point at 32 degrees, but that does mean if for whatever reason your concrete hits 32 degrees or lower for even a short period of time, it is just going to end up showing that it's gaining absolutely zero strength. But we'd like to do this because, you know, it, those are the best conservative numbers, and we still always want to edge on the side of being conservative with this. Um, this also is not a method for long-term strength. This is seven days, 14 days at best, maybe 28 days. Some people do use it for that. But for the most part, this really is for that early age stage. The consistency of concrete is important. There's a mixed change, but then there's also, we've worked on projects where 
concrete is coming in from various suppliers and that's something that we need to work around as well. It can be done, but it's something that needs to be um, taken into account. And there is a verification on that calibration that needs to be done once in a while, typically every year. Um, but definitely if you think that you've changed, you know, um, a certain proportion of, of something within your mix, doing a verification is important just to make sure you've got the right stuff there. And just in general, you know, people are always asking, well, how can I get started? Um, so, you know, the first thing that we say that I would tell you is you need to monitor your concrete strength in real time using the sensors. Um, you need to detect what time um, that strength is achieved, send that field cured cylinder to the lab and approve the break results. We are not expecting that this is going to be, you know, tomorrow you're just gonna start using sensors, forget the cylinders, I don't need them anymore. That's not realistic and that's not the case. In the beginning, you want to do this in conjunction with the sensors because it doesn't matter how many times, um, you know, we work with lots of engineering companies, lots of testing agencies, producers, contractors, you name it. Just because we worked with one you know, company before on one project doesn't mean we're going to be able to get the approval of every stakeholder on the next project. People want to be able to make sure that this can be used in conjunction first until they get you know, that reliability that the sensors are going to work, especially when it's their first time. And that's completely natural and we definitely help to do that. Um, but then of course, share those results with other stakeholders and it's very easy to do that with technology now. You send a report right from your phone as Dan was talking about before. And um, at that, I'll open it up to questions if anyone has any. Larry, I don't know how people submit questions. Do they just write in the chat? You're on mute. Yeah, there you go. They, they just ask them. Oh, I'm, we open it All up right. on themselves and they can ask. Given it's the end of the day, we may have tired everybody out. <laughs> Um, I'll add in here that um, if anyone is interested in getting started and wants to know more um, firsthand, some see some of them in action, um, get a hold of me. I've got a lot of data from the past that I can I'd be happy to share with you. Um, I'll provide everybody with uh, as long as she's okay with it, uh, Sarah's contact information. This will be a recording um, put on our website with the rest of our videos and webinars, so it'll always be there for you to access. Um, and we can help you out in any way. Um, so reach out to myself, Sarah. Um, I'd leave the grumpy bear Dan alone. Um, he's busy smoking cigars and chasing bridges. So. <laughs> wow. um, the other thing, Larry, that I mentioned. Oh, sorry, John. Yeah. Um, my name's John. I work in uh, I work in the concrete industry um, with a concrete subcontractor, and I just. We, we use maturity meters on some of our jobs. I would ask on your, uh, for your specifically, what's the, um, what would be like the number one, you know, troubles, troubleshooting question or, or uh, issue that arises with the use of your prod, uh, product and how do you get through that? Um, such an interesting question um, because I've had the same one happen. We, like three times today, actually. Um, we are we have been sending a, a few samples to a few companies that have never used them before it's kind of a we launched a new sensor recently so we we sent a bunch to some companies that we've never worked for before we said hey we'd like to work with you you know give these a try and let us know what you think um three of them have already embedded the sensors and have now called us and said i don't see my strengths and when we say oh well where's your maturity calibration what's that oh gosh okay well you know, sometimes people, we, we have had it happen before where people are thinking it's going to be a magic sensor that just you pop in and it gives you your strength. And um, it's, it's always a, a fun conversation to have. It, that was the thing that happened a lot in the beginning when we first launched these. Now I'd say probably that the toughest one is, and this is something that we spent a lot of time on, is making sure that people install them correctly. Um, I think that the new sensor that we just brought out, it's we call it dummy proof. Like, I, I don't know how somebody could make a mistake in installing this new one that we have. In the past, we had to enforce people um, reinforcing them with zip ties and tape to make sure that they wouldn't budge in the concrete. Um, and even having little things that go on the tip of the wires that you kind of twist them together, that's what connects it to the rebar. And, uh, and sometimes they would lose circuit because people didn't twist them tight enough. And I think a lot of it was around installation. Um, so honestly, I'm really happy to see that I think our new sensors are really going to change a lot of that, but I'm sure there's going to be newer problems after that. Um, 
I, I think that's really the kind of the main the main thing that, that people struggle with is, is installing them and having the trust that the person beside them is going to install them. But these days with everything being online and um, remote, we've really cracked down and we've really, I, I don't know, Dan, I guess would have gone through it, but I feel like we've really refined the process of making sure that in 15 minutes, you get a very quick training session on everything that you need to know about it. And you get a box that tells you exactly what to do as soon as you open it. I think we've gotten that process really down pat. Um, and the new sensors, we'll find out whether or not we still face issues and maybe we'll have a whole new range of issues. Who knows? But right now, I, I would say installation and making sure that it's exactly where you need it to be is the main one. Gotcha. So zip ties and duct tape included with your product? <laughs> Um, not the new one because it's not necessary, but um, mm -hmm. there are some zip ties in there to make sure that the temperature table is where you need it to be. But the puck that Dan was talking about, you don't need anything anymore. It's just very intuitive and you shouldn't have to use it at all. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I would add that when we're, you're creating your curves, this is just from experience. You want the worst case scenario. So if you can have, you need your air 6% plus or minus uh, 1%. You're going to want to do your curve at a close to seven um, slump. You can have a you want to be on the high end because we all know that concrete is inconsistent when it comes. You want it consistent. Everybody would love to have concrete at a perfect slump, but we all know it's going to be all over the the place and air is affected by water, so moisture is an aggregate. So always go with your worst case air and your worst case slump when you make your curve. What that'll do is give you the buffer. So if you're always on the high side. Um, of maturity, you're always going to be better. So if it always, does that mm -hmm. make sense? So that's that's just a, a little bit of guidance. Just always use the worst case scenario when you're ca casting your curve. Yeah, I think the other thing, just to kind of elaborate on John's um, question a bit, it kind of just came to mind now, is I, I think the one thing that we struggle with from time to time is that um, people think that this is more complicated than it is. Um, because of the fact that it, it was really complicated to do before. And I'm not saying it was crazy complicated. Larry had it down to a science. He was using thousands of them years ago and no problems. But um, I think people have it in their head that this is really complicated when, in fact, we can send sensors. We get on a call with you for 15 minutes. You've embedded them and you're off to the races. And we've really tried to make it as simple as possible. Um, but because it's something new, um even myself like i just got a new smart tv and i was i was like i can't just set this up myself i'm not very good with technology which is very ironic and i recognize that um but i thought there's no way i can set this up myself and within 20 minutes it was fine um now the automatic lights that are supposed to be compatible with alexa has been another thing and i can't figure those out but i'll figure it out someday um but i think it's just over complicating it when it's not necessary is, is a big thing that kind of gets into people's heads I, I, I actually I actually had a question for Sarah and maybe it's something um, maybe it's something that she doesn't want to talk about I don't know but I noticed I, I oh, love God. to browse websites and I noticed that there was I'm always looking for my my big thing right now is permeability and finding out what's going on with that so it's just my geek mm -hmm. taking over but um, I've noticed mm -hmm. in here that you have the an iCore wireless NDT corrosion detector. Could you talk about that for a second? Yeah, um, I can. So, and I mean, as somebody who works on bridges, this is probably very relevant to you. Um, the iCore device is ironically actually the reason GSAC was developed as a company um, because the corrosion technology that our founders created is just so light years ahead of its time. Um, essentially, that's the only device on the market right now um, where you can get the rate of corrosion. So how many um, ums per, I can't remember the metric anymore, um, but exactly what the measurement of how much it's corroded, how quickly it's corroding. And it doesn't require a connection to the rebar, which is very unique, obviously. The um, other ways of doing that with um, half cell potential is kind of the more common one, but you need to kind of drill that hole in, connect to the rebar. You need to have the rebar perfectly mapped out. Um, with the iCore, you don't need to, to have that connection to the rebar, and it takes the measurements within like eight seconds. Um, whereas the other devices in the past, you kind of have to pin it down, leave it there for two minutes, I think, then record everything manually. This is very like click, 
all records into a corrosion mapping device on, on a tablet and it uses that Bluetooth technology again. So that was actually long before the sensors, that was kind of our main, we were really focused on durability testing, corrosion testing, all of the MDT stuff. And then we decided to take that Bluetooth technology and apply it to these maturity sensors. And that's what really took us off, so. Okay, so I tell you what, why don't you go ahead and um, send me that and I'll do a review uh, for you. Sure. And and we'll okay. just, I'll just, okay. I'll just make that happen. I, my whole point, I just want to make, I just want to make Rick and, and Mike Nelson jealous that I've got something that they don't to test concrete with. <laughs> Perfect. So, so would this I work? They're on, uh, would this work on a, a PT structure um, that has DCI in it, so you can tell what the long-term effect and how accurate your uh, DCI was working, how efficiently? Yeah, exactly. Um, it definitely could do that. Um, you would want to wait at least a year into like building the structure before you apply anything like this because you're not going to get anything after that or before that. But after about a year has gone by, um, doing those types of assessments is, is relevant. I have a new toy I want. That, I do too. <laughs> I, I just heard Larry. I, will, I have a new toy that I, I, I love. I would love to get this on uh, some bridge decks and see what's going on. Some that we've done a couple years ago, some that uh, uh, you know we could wait on. But that I, I I got a feeling there's a couple a couple other people that whose names I see up here that would be very interested uh, to see what this was. And the best part is, is I've got slabs out back um, that are all cut there you up. Go. And, and once I once I look at it, I can actually break it apart with a hammer and really look. So um, that would be that would be really cool. I would I would enjoy that. So you just go ahead and send that to me. We'll make sure. Okay, sure. I will. We'll we'll work that out. What I'll do is, you know, Larry, I I said to everyone right before that I would, you know, put this into a PDF, send it to you. You can send it off to everybody who's on this, okay. um, just so that they have it as a reference. Um, but I'll I can send some of that I-Core information over as well, and we can continue to chat about it. I yeah, could send one to both of you, unless you can share, but I don't feel like you two are very good at sharing. It's just a hunch. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Rough. Yeah. That's rough. <laughs> no, I, 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 I would share. I mean, I, I would share. I share well with others. <laughs> she says that. <laughs> All right, guys. Sarah, I appreciate this you guys having me on. Thank you so much. I wish it could be in person. I really do miss doing these presentations and then going for beers after. That really is the best part, but um, we'll have to do that on my own. <laughs> we'll come down here this summer after all the COVID's gone and we'll uh, we'll do this again in person. We'll take you out to Top Golf afterwards. I love that. We don't have that here. <laughs> it's like my favorite thing to do. Great. Right, thank you so Does anybody much. else have? What is Does anybody else have any, any other questions? What are the costs of those sensors anyway? Um, so our sensors run for about $100 a piece, and that's it. There's no software, hardware additions, or anything like that on top. Um, you just buy them as you need them, and, and that's it. Okay. Very so simple, that... Hey, simple Rick, answer. I, oh, I, I, I noticed you were the one oh, asking. So that makes them seventy five dollars yeah, US, actually, right? No, no. I know that we're a Canadian company, but we do operate in US. So Rick, I ended up getting more than I needed um for that job and I wanted to use it on another one. And so I've got plenty of leftover. I mean I used nine on the last one, including the samples, and I I've got plenty left. So um if you uh, and I, I just bought them. So if you guys want to use them or have some to try, um, I'm, I've got plenty. So, um, and it is really easy and, and somewhat intuitive to go through and set up. I think maybe I spent on everything and in, in time together, maybe three thousand dollars. I think on everything total, and I could see. Oh, right. you know, and yeah, well, I mean, if and and if I could see um using this for more if i can use you know where i wanted if i put seven or so in a bridge and for what i've got i can i can stretch this out for a season depending on where i want the sensors to go so a, a, 
a couple sensors or a box of sensors goes a long way. And what I like is being able to yeah. label all that in the app, knowing not only you know the location, you know where it's at, what it's all that information is tied to the sensor then when you first initiate it. Um, so it's it's you know if you looked at my desk right now, you'd see papers everywhere. But when you log into that cloud, it tells you right where your project is, what sensors are there. I mean, all the data is there. I could I could literally you know lose lose the data that I have for the beam breaks and forget what they were. Um, but if I go online, log into the cloud, it's still all there. That's I guess that's what I like for it's there in. in uh, for a longer period of time, it's it's it is pretty nice. In cost comparison to normal testing, a hundred dollars per sensor is very cheap when you consider that just a break alone for a cylinder can run anywhere between sixty to a hundred dollars. So if you had to make early age breaks and you were doing two or three cylinders, you will exceed that cost in one series of breaks. And it's very very important to understand that that once you make your curve, you get out past that. And you start using this, it is a money saver, it's a time saver, schedule saver. Across the board, it's the best concept on the market right now. And Dan, I was I was surprised that you said three thousand because I found that to be really low if you were considering your time and everything. That's pretty low. So um that's really interesting. You can ask anybody, my um, time is really considered worth nothing. It, so. it is. He's right. <laughs> I see uh, self-esteem is doing really well as well. Good. Um, and Rick, all I'm going to I'm just going to say that Dan, if you do end up giving him some sensors, that make sure his contact information gets given to our support team, just so that um, right. we make sure that we jump on 15-minute call is all we need to make sure that you're doing everything perfect. So. Yeah, and if I remember right, when I bought it and not knowing anything, um, uh, they were delivered to me almost two days later, and then it wasn't yeah. too long. I, you had a, a, you, there was a whole team of people that we kind of went through almost the same PowerPoint that you went through, only it was more based towards engineering and how maturity works and how to do it. It was mm -hmm. it was very. They uh, Geotech took a lot of time in explaining somebody that didn't know how how the how the um, sensors work. Um, and getting them up, getting them running, and uh, it didn't—it didn't take very long at all. And I don't even consider myself one of the smart engineers, so um, yeah. it, it, worked, it worked. It worked really well. Good, really good feedback. Anyone else have any questions? What do you think, Mike Nelson? I bet I bet he took a nap. I don't I don't I don't think Mike Nelson takes naps. I bet he wrote down every word. <laughs> I'm ignoring Rick. <laughs> Really quickly, I should thank Rich for setting this up as well. Thank you, Rich, for passing that on. If I had have known that our when we were in Peoria, if that was the last show that I was ever going to be at before all of this, I feel like would have treated it differently. But thank you for passing my information along. Yeah, no worries. So if there's nothing else. I just want to say thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, we will be in contact with you. We want to push this a little more. Um, there's kind of a void in the uh, the market right now. We've had a couple companies that have one, Hilti's bought one, and one is going out of business currently. So there's a void in this, and we need to educate more and more people. So we're going to reach out to you more just for education. We're going to get this online, but I want to make sure everybody uh, – in our area has the means to uh, contact you and can you know implement this type of research again it was a pleasure dan do you have anything you'd like to add no uh you know i mean i i i i have really I've, i i talk too much all, already as it is so um i i just think that 
I, I, I think I was really excited about it. It was technology that I had not played with before. Um, and I could see I would be very beneficial to DOTs and contractors in the commercial industry. Um, and I know we've got some concrete pumpers on um, for ACPA, and I would only advise them that how this relates to you as a concrete pumper would be if, if you know going into it that you're working with a contractor that's used to using sensors, you might as well figure that it's probably going to be an accelerated schedule um, because mm -hmm. they're, they're going to know that data sooner and they, their, their schedule will progress and they will save days. Um, because I could see that I could see that happening in in my line of work um, to where I, if I can shave a couple of days, that's kind of big. Uh, so so and if you multiply that by stories, you know you're you're going up seven, eight, ten stories, and you're moving false work every day, then it probably by the end of the job that that's probably a pretty good time savings, which means as a concrete pumper, your your window in dispatch gets smaller. Uh, so, you just want to be prepared to have a pump there maybe every four days rather than every seven days um, depending on what that schedule looks like it's just something to put in the back of your mind to plan nothing left for my side either sarah it was a pleasure um i'll give you a call later um talk about a few items but uh Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate this. Um, definitely a pleasure, and we'll do this again, hopefully in person next time. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Thank you guys very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Larry.